And now, I'd like to introduce our friends, Glenn and Judy Morningstar, who are here um, to present today's tea. Glenn and Judy Morningstar grew up in the Saginaw Valley, where their families enjoyed the music and dancing that was around them at Grange dances and house parties. And they both have been playing music since they were kids. When they moved down to Rochester in 1965, their musical interests were broadened with, the, with discovering the Rochester Folk Workshop and the Detroit Country Dance Society. Judy and Glenn formed the old Michigan Roughwater String Band in 1978, and that band has played all over the Midwest and into Canada for concerts and dances since then. Glenn and the band led the monthly contra dancing series at Lovett Hall at Greenfield Village in Dearborn from 1981 to 2004. And they, each year, they lead Regency period dancing and Civil War era dancing in many towns in Michigan and the Midwest, including teaching Civil War era dancing to eighth graders here at our museum at a special program that we do wow. here. Um, Glenn and Judy have been friends of our museum for many years, and we always appreciate their presence and sharing their knowledge and music with us today. Today, they'll share the historical elements of dance styles, clothing, and music from the European settlement of the American colonies through today. So I hope you'll enjoy, that we'll all enjoy today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Thanks very much. It's a treat to be back here at the Troy Historical Museum in Village. We enjoy it here a lot, and it's a treat to be with you all here. Uh, can you hear this okay out there? Yes. Okay. If you can't, uh, cup your ear, and that will help me uh, <laughs> realize where I'm not being heard. Uh, 300 years of dance. Uh, this presentation uh, will not go without uh, a little hiccup here and there, and that's because uh, this will be the first presentation we've done where we've added something so you can visually see how dancing is done in the 1700s and 1800s at reenactments that we've had here in Michigan and in Indiana uh, for the periods uh, that we'll describe. So not only are we going to talk about it, but rather show you it and so you can see what it's like, like both from a clothing perspective, music perspective, and a movement perspective. So. Um, We're also going to present little snippets of music uh, to get you in the mood for the videos as we get there. Uh, Judy Morningstar is on hammer dulcimer, and uh, that's a, an instrument very common in Michigan for many uh, centuries, many centuries. And uh, she'll tell you about it in more detail as we go between slides or things like that. But imagine tuning that. Uh, for those of you that know the inside of a piano, you'll recognize much the same as uh, piano tuning arrangements with pins and things like that. So it's a for it's a f uh, a forerunner of the piano. It's about two thousand years old. That particular. Not this instrument. How old is it? How old would you say? Forerunner. How old is that instrument? This instrument here. It goes back two thousand years. Oh. At least. They found pictures of the dulcimer in tombs in Egypt. And uh, <coughs> back then it was a much simpler instrument, of course. It, it made its way to Michigan through the, through the lumbering era, came across for lumberjacks. But they found um, ship's logs in the 1600s with, that included the dulcimer from England. <coughs> Well, I, that was a good, quick question, and that's, and that's uh, if you have an extended question that would be good for us to discuss, if you would say that for the end, but a, good, a quick question like that, too, do ask as we go. We're going to play a little tune, and uh, poor Anne, she's going to have heard this tune for many times. It's one of our favorite. Um, in the 1700s, much of the dancing, of course, was a reflection of the settlements of the French and the British. And so many of the tunes and the dances came from those two areas. Here's a, a dance from the early 1700s, 1721, that still reflected some of the minuet step that uh, came from France and was being incorporated into the dancing in what was called English country dance. And we'll show you what the minuet step looks like, at least from that period. But here's a tune that goes with the dance called Hole in the Wall. 
And for those of you that are music, as music uh, players and music research people, it's in 3-2 time. Uh, today's music is typically 4-4, four, 2-4, four, 6-8, two, 2-2, four, two, two. Uh, but this is 3-2, which is a cousin to 3-4. Uh, <laughs> so so we'll, we'll play this for you and then we'll, I'll show you the stepping. <coughs> Stitch it, make a different dress. And so the fabric was quite loose. So you did see a lot of uh, uh, jumping around during these dances. <laughs> <laughs> and typically the, the, the movements never went above the, the arm. So most of the movements ended here because both men and women. So most of the hand holes were down here like this. And we'll see in a second how the, the, the hand holes that played into the into the period. And also, uh, the pox epidemic uh, had scourged the world, and people had terrible scars that survived the smallpox epidemic. So the makeup that they were put in, that was lard based. You know what lard is? <laughs> and so they put lard on to cover the scars and then powder the lard. So oh, yes. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the one fact that always gets a gasp out of people is that if you had a particularly bad pock scar, they would take the underbelly of a mice, cut a little circle, and put that on, that was a beauty mark. So imagine dancing, dancing uh, was constricted or restricted by clothing and what people 
had on their faces. And literally, if you, if you acted too uh, vigorous, you would lose your face. <laughs> Okay, um, well, we should see something. We should take a look at this. Uh, what we're going to see here is uh, a reenactment, and um, it. Uh, ah, Regency Ball uh, at the Palais Royal, which is in South Bend, Indiana, right next to uh, the Notre Dame campus. Yeah, uh, we could probably skip that. <laughs> that's the that's the violinist that we have dulcimer and and, and harp at far left. You can see the harp, but we'll get right to some of the dancing. And uh, this dance is the Grand March. It's from 1808. Uh, the music uh, is from 1808, but it was done through the 1700s. There were many Grand March tunes. This particular one is from. Uh, uh, late in the period, into the Regency period, which was 1790 to 1820. Uh, people think of Pride and Prejudice, and the author, Jane Austen. Jane Austen. And uh, so this is the Grand March. Uh, what you'll notice is that people are in, in pairs. Uh, the style of dance is from the period. The uh, style of, of attire is from the period. Uh, Empire Waistline, uh, this is a masquerade ball, so everyone's wearing masks. Um, the gents, uh, some of them are dressed in period costumes, some are dressed in other periods uh, from the Regency era, and they're promenading the perimeter. The intent of the Grand March was that people could see the latest fashions, they could see who was stepping properly, they could see who was, they could see who uh, was treating their proper their partner with the proper respect, because uh, dance cars were still very prevalent then. So uh, if you wanted to dance with someone, you would approach the manager of the hall uh, and ask to be introduced. And once introduced, if you asked a lady to dance and she said, yes, it was wonderful, she said, no, there's certain rules about that that I'll read you in a while. Um, but uh, very much a social activity without much touching. So. This Grand March allowed you to hold the hand of someone for quite some period of time. And we'll see a dance pretty quick that allows you to touch others' hands. Uh, still, uh, very little showing of the ladies' legs. Uh, you'll notice britches by the gents, still left over from the 1700s primarily. And they didn't wear long pants back then because it was easier to wash your socks than it was to take your drawers someplace and have your trousers and have them washed uh, in the mud. Uh, Grand March starts with promenade the perimeter, and then they come up the center, first couple left, next couple right, next couple left, next couple right. And so uh, we've got two columns promenading the perimeter, and pretty soon they'll form up uh, at the foot of the hall into lines of four. Lines of four uh, will do things that are unique to a particular Grand March. The, the figures that are the pearls of the Grand March include one called uh, the clover leaf. And if you looked at it from above, it would look like a four leaf clover, with everyone marching around one leaf of the clover, basically. And uh, so here's the line of four coming up the center here. Um, then the next, first line of four goes left, next line of four goes right. And you can see what some of these gentlemen are wearing. Typically, uh, again, breeches. The Regency period was a period when they had uh, gone from the, the lengthy vests, which they called waistcoats. Um, to a short vest, and everything went white. A lot of white vests, white ties, and so you'll see that on some of the gents uh, as uh, they come around. So here they've gone halfway down the outside, and they've come into the middle as lines of four, and in the middle uh, they're going to separate as couples from their current line of four and create new lines of four. Here they start the clover leaf, one leaf. So one leaf is going this way, another leaf is going that way. Similarly in the back, We've got the clover leaves going. Uh, other figures were the serpentine, which looks like it sounds. It was just a big snake that went down the hall. Sometimes they'd even do two snakes <laughs> and come back. And then cross corners, people would promenade to the perimeter, 
down in the far corners and then cross corners meeting in the middle and again every other couple passes in the middle like a big X on the floor. Pretty amazing. So these folks here again are walking the clover leaf. Uh, typically it is the dance that starts <coughs> the events and most of these are three hour dances. Uh, very typical, sometimes four. And, and, and there's typically a meal in the middle. These dances are pretty. Uh, this, this particular ballroom uh, is pretty amazing. You can't hardly see all of it, but it's a lot of gold leaf and it was pretty special. Pretty special. It's not of the period, it was, it was built later than 1790. Uh, but uh, it's well preserved and still active today. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna slip ahead a little bit here. Well, we should play the music. Yes. Why am I why am I yapping without music? We heard the last of the music. The music was the grand march. <laughs> well, what I'm going to do now is we're going to slip forward to uh, a dance called La Bagatelle, or the flirtation. Many of these dances had uh, this theme. <laughs> and um, I can find this here. From here. This is a typical instruction right here. And you'll, you'll see I'm leading and showing people what the dance movements are. In those days, 1700s, that would not happen. People would come because the dance masters in the area would have gone to homes and taught them the dances. The program would have been published ahead of time. And people would have known, oh, La Bagatelle is on the program. And so we want to learn it. So when we come, we uh, can join when the dance is announced. So they would say, look, I can tell a long ways. And people would bring their partners out and form up as you see them. Uh, first thing they'll do is take hands the This particular style of dance, again, 1700s, late 1700s, all the men are on one side, all the ladies on the other. And they're working in groups of two couples. So if you looked at it from nearest the music, it would go couple one, couple two, couple one, couple two, couple one, couple two. Any square dancers in here, it would be the head couples, head couples of a square dance. And there would be no side couples, just the head couples. So you notice here all the men on one side, ladies the other. Um, hand holds, uh, very gentle, quite low. Jen offers his right hand to the lady, she puts her hand in his. You see a lot of that. And uh, let's see if this is gonna start up. Circle left, three hands, circle left. And they set to the second gentleman. The setting step was a show off step. The number ones were the active couples. The ones are going down the center. Twos are resting to get back to the issue of their makeup. And they cast round the twos. Right hand turn, one time round. And back with the left. I'll show you a setting step. There's a show off step. And it's just, uh, depending on the age and the ability of the, of the people doing it, maybe it's going to be this. The twos are working their way up, they become ones, they work their way down. So the confusion point in a dance is typically the ends. But by the time people do it a couple times through, there's no more confusion in front. So the camera here will catch some of the confusion. But if you look further down, you notice everybody's fine.
This is in jig time. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Settings that here. Very typical 1700s. Another figure that was early 1700s uh, was called the Rigadoon. A lot of the Scottish influence in America was also uh, felt and it became part of the dancing here. Uh, this particular dance, the flirtation and love I tell, uh, that, uh, did I write it down? Uh, John Griffiths was the earliest of the dance composers in the colonies, and that was one of his. And we're going to see another one of his, uh, John Griffiths. And uh, the Rigadoon <coughs> was earlier in the century, and it was. We get a lot of uh, Irish Scottish influence. And the dances uh, that we call square dances today, in the early 1700s, were called cotillions, came from the French. And the cotillions were like a, a song, if we think of it structure-wise, and they would have a verse and a chorus. Second verse, same chorus. Third verse, same chorus. Fourth verse, same chorus. So a verse might be, uh, first couples go forward and back. First couples, bring a new set. And they set. Did it, did it, did bring a new Three, four, and circle F. And, and then the chorus would be, interestingly enough, for any square dancers here, the old, one of the oldest figures is the grand square, as we call it today. Heads forward and sides divide. So the heads go forward and meet, they connect and they back up, and they separate, and they go meet their partner and reverse all that. It was a figure from the 1700s. People don't realize that. Uh, but these cotillions then morphed into some other dancing we'll talk about later. Um, let's see, where are we going with this? <laughs> the, I'm going to show you a real quick segment from a dance also of this period, and it's one of Griffith's, uh, called um, The Pleasures of Love. <laughs> You can get some sense of the opulence of this place from some of these stills. This is, I mentioned that things would not go perfect. There'd be a little glitch once in a while. This is one of those times. Uh, here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. I think this is four. Yeah. Whoops. No. Nope. And we have to stop those other people from dancing. That's right. <laughs> Computers are our friends. <laughs> the next dance you're going to see is much the same figures, except more, um, more figures. And I say that because in an evening's program, as people come to these dances, I start out with. Uh, let's try that. Here we go. Pleasures of the time. The dance begins with right hands across, making a star, left hands back. And then the number one couples, every other couple goes down the outside of the line, and they come back. They're more active, called the active sometimes, then they go down the center. And they return to their twos, they cast around their twos to trade places. No city for a circle left. Back to the right. It's all in phrases of music. Each turn of the dance, 
one whole time through. 64 counts takes about 35 seconds. So every 35 seconds you get a new couple to, to dance with. Town was the tune that was being played on violin, uh, dulcimer, and the pianoforte. For that. Well, let's set the stage for 1800s. 1800s. Um, weaving and fulling, everyone knows what fulling is, making felt out of wool. That's a fulling bill. That was what my ancestors did. And uh, so wool, uh, flax, cotton, uh, silks, if you could afford them. Uh, we're, we're being part of the attire, and the attire was built more, much more durable because people were wearing them uh, many more times. And uh, I say that because it allowed more arm movement and more rigor in the dance. And so you start to see that. Uh, the music of the day, too, had became more rigorous. And uh, we'll even play something that reflects that. Um, deportment, still very conservative. If you wanted to dance with somebody, you had to be introduced. And that's early 1800s to the late 1800s. Henry Ford, when he met Clara Bryant, he was not allowed to walk up to her and say, hey, I'm Henry, who are you? You know, they had to be introduced. And uh, so that was very much the styles of the 1800s. In fact, let me read you something. Uh, this book right here is uh, Gem to the Ballroom. And it's 1896. This is the real thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's four callers. So in here is plane control number one, plane control number two, lancers, uh, a, a, a dance that we'll see shortly, uh, old quadrilles, Caledonians. And so that was a very popular book for teachers. And there was a series of music books that went with it. So you could buy a music book. In fact, there were 10 of them that had the music that would fit those dances. Here's one from 1899, Kornacker's Quadrille Call Book and Guide to Etiquette. Uh, and that was, a, that was a leftover from the late 1700s when they started to publish these dance books. They weren't allowed to call them dance books because uh, there was still a lot of Puritan influence, but they called, they called them books of etiquette, which included dancing, by the way. So here's a little something from Kornacker's. Uh, a uh, lady should never promenade the ballroom alone, nor enter it unaccompanied. <laughs> um, the lady's dressing room is a sacred precinct into which no gentleman should presume to look. <laughs> to, uh, to, to enter it would be an outrage not to be forgiven. <laughs> and the reason that's there is because in, there's rules about entering the ballroom. The gentleman having escorted his lady to her dressing room door, and having sought his own dressing room, should arrange his toilet as quickly as possible, and return to the ladies room where his lady will join him at the door and accompany him to the ballroom. Uh, a gentleman should always dance first with his partner and is also under obligations to her for the first dance after supper, as well as the last number on the program. But in between, he would fill up other women's dance cards. <laughs> um, and, and again, these are time proven. Do not sway the body with each step. Do not hold the arms stiffly. Do not hold the arms out straight in imitation of a windmill fan. <laughs> these are great to read. <laughs> anyway. Women, two women, it didn't matter. That's correct. As long as you had a partner. That's correct. Uh, often the women would dance with each other. It, right. As to the, we still do. Still do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the dance figures of the day, uh, the advent of the waltz, the two couple dance, <coughs> a couple dancing, waltz, polka, shoddy, uh, gallop, 
mazurka. They became part of the old cotillions to make these quadrilles of the middle 1800s. And these quadrilles took, uh, really started to take over and you didn't see so many long ways dances, the old reels and things like that other than the Virginia reel which hung on. Uh, but uh, these uh, uh, couple dances, you'd see some figures right and left in, in uh, jig time or four four time. Then all of a sudden you hear this da 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 There'd be a precise waltzing around the, the quadrille that you would see. Um, what else should I see? Oh, second half of the century, brass bands. Uh, Henry Ford's uncles played in the brass band in Dearborn, rode the bandwagon around town. So uh, he put the cymbal uh, and the sousaphone in his orchestra. Uh, you know, his fondness for the sousaphone. We should play a tune. The tune we're going to play for you is uh, a tune from Plank Wood Drill number two, figure three, one of the Plank Wood Drills. But it was typical of the day, they would often create new tunes, but they would also take tunes from the day. First tune is uh, Kingdom Coming for the Year of Jubilo from 1863. Second tune is Listen to the Mockingbird, <laughs> which was from 1855. Oh, <laughs> so uh, we'll play this together, then I'll describe the figures that would be danced uh, with this. Uh, show you next uh, is a dance called Petronella. It had its uh, origins in Scottish tradition and in America it was uh, changed from a long ways and also three facing three to a six couple long ways set and the six couple long ways set uh, in particular we're going to see a couple of times through. This dance you're going to see is in a meadow in Jackson at the Jackson Cascades if anybody's ever been to the Jackson Cascades. Uh, every year we have a ball there, 240 to 300 people dancing. Wow. It's pretty amazing. So I'm going to find it and <laughs> let's see here how we can make this happen. You want to tell them about uh, Jackson a bit, Judy? Oh, sure. I, I, thought I might talk about, um, we're wearing the garb that we have on is Civil War period. And uh, 
As you can see, it's a little bit restricting. A lot of that lady styles came, the, the shoulder seam came down off their shoulders. So you couldn't lift your hands way up, but it was a little less restricting than the previous period. Um, this, this would be typical, more evening, that's the pattern. And then for, for day wear, you have a blouse and, um, and a long skirt. Um, yeah. Is that enough? That's great, thank you. <laughs> well, here it is in the meadow, and it's just starting to get dusk. And you can get a sense from this. You can just see some of the people. Unfortunately, there's metal vehicles up there that can take away from it a little bit. But, um, and we're going to see... Okay. Six couples long, please. Gents on the left, lady on the right, gentlemen on the left, lady on the right, facing the center, four couples. We think of it today as a square dance. But this old uh, cotillion, again, was part of the evolution to the quadrilles of the day. Um, I'll talk about the figures that you're going to see once you get into them. Again, hand holes, uh, I'll describe those when we get there, too. Couple, you'll get a chance to promenade on the inside, and fourth couple as well. So, um, thank you for being quick learners. Grand Chain, all four ladies 
right hands across the left way, courtesy turn right in the side, or Dan Star, halfway, courtesy turn it home. Ladies forward in honor, courtesy, just forward in salute. You can see them saluting. <laughs> and here's the repeating chorus. Ladies grand chain over and back. Notice the attire, Judy's dress is very fashionable, and you can see other dresses on period there. The gents are wearing, in this case, vests. This collar that you see here, this, this uh, particular vest was made in Port Huron, it's handmade, and it is from the period. And you can see how the collars, uh, they would change. There's a great book called What People Wore, and it follows from the 1600s, maybe in the 1500s, all the way through to today. And you can see the changes in the lapels and, and the length of the collars and things like that. Very typical. Um, you can see promenade, that one fellow there was promenading with his hand over the lady's back. Varsuvian hold was the, really the promenade of the day. Uh, the other one with the hand around the waist was really not allowed, uh, but uh, here they do it. You notice gloves, gloves. That's a carryover from the 1700s. Imagine dancing with someone who had uh, sharp and dirty fingernails and you got cut. You got cut in the 1700s. That would infect, and you could you could die from that casual, uh, you know, acquaintance. So gloves were worn pretty readily. That was back before sulfurs and anything else. Those things. Again, uh, notice the attire, not a military attire, this was a, a, a military ball in a meadow, so it had moved from the ballrooms uh, to the meadows in the 1800s. And uh, in particular, a lot of field dancing, it meant they had big tents that were brought out where people were camped, and where soldiers were camped, and the wives would come, and uh, they would dance in the field, literally. Okay, this was uh, 1800s, a little piece of it anyway. This particular dance, uh, 1847, give you an idea. Let's step forward to the 1900s. That was, how was that video? Imagine it being in the evening in here too, we'd probably be able to see that a little better. What do you think of the video? Is that decent? Uh, yeah, you see that pretty good. Maybe not so well from the sides, but <coughs> very good. So let's get out of here. I can do that. Judy maybe has another little something she could share with you as I look for the. <laughs> 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 I already showed you the dulcimer. Um, it originated, they, they think, in what would have been Iran. Um, the, the, the first dulcimer mm -hmm. spotting, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But um, you can see there's bridges here. The center bridge is what's called the treble bridge. And there, the, it's placed so it's two-fifths and three-fifths. It divides the, the, the sound board up into two-fifths and three-fifths. So if you play the notes across the string, let me see if I can do that without dropping it. Um, <laughs> set up on this so we have a, a D scale the, the fourth note of the D scale is a G and then so far the, to the C scale 
is hit with this, these mallets, and you'll find um, all sorts of different mallets that people use to strike their instrument with. Um, back in the um, early part of this, the last century, <laughs> last century, um, you'd see uh, corset staves with little balls on the end of them. <laughs> and I, I knew a few players who actually used those, and they're really, we we're actually, I tried to play with a pair, and there's no control. They're all <laughs> <laughs> but every, every Dalsmer player, yeah. player has their own favorite set of hammers, and mm -hmm. you take those away from them, and they're in big trouble. <laughs> it's harder to use somebody else's hammers on your own Dalsmer than it is to play somebody else's Dalsmer with your hammers. <laughs> well, Michigan has the largest contingent of Dalsmer players in the States. That, uh, as we get together in July, they'll have thousands. thousands. <laughs> well, let's talk about the 1900s. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was a, a vast departure from the set dancing, like we've seen here. World War I had an influence on that. The cabarets where women could, where single women could go and dance with a single man without introduction. Vernon Irene Castle were uh, teaching the fox trot, uh, the two-step, and some others. And uh, so there's a great departure from the set dances. Uh, and Henry Ford, in particular, as he was gathering things down in, in Dearborn and publishing his books, uh, he wanted to re recall and, and uh, bring back the good dancing that he had enjoyed in the 1800s when he met Clara. And uh, so he brought in Benjamin Lovett from Sudbury, Massachusetts, and they started teaching dancing down there in the old-fashioned style. Um, then. Uh, Regarding the quadrilles, we talked about cotillions going from nine figures to the five figures of a quadrille. quadrille. And then they would pick, in the 1900s, they picked the favorite figure out of the quadrille and start putting popular tunes with it. And that would be the square dance of the 1900s, the early 1900s. Hot time in the old town tonight. It was first couple right and you circle four hands round. Lead to the next and you circle six hands round. Pick up two more and you circle eight hands round. It'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. And that was the dance. And that was playing quadrille number two, figure three, done to old music in the 1800s, but it was the same dance. Um, the, the dancing uh, of the day, uh, because of the non-restriction in clothing in the 1900s and more particularly after World War II uh, changed as well. We're going to play you a tune that you can get a sense of how it compares to the tunes that you've heard previously uh, with the 1700s and the 1800s. Here's a 1900s tune. And uh, of course the tune names were associated with what was happening at the time. So. Uh, this is meant to be no offense to anyone, but the name of this too, it comes out of New England. It's called a Growling Old Man and Grumbling Old Woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Growling Old Man and Grumbling Old Woman. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a good one. So again, uh, characterize this to da 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 Uh, and again, uh, the dancing, of course, was less restricted to, as you 
you want to see. <laughs> this uh, particular dance here, very typical of the 1900s, even though it was uh, just uh, not many months back. Um, and I'll, I'll say ahead of time so you can enjoy this music. What's the same, two couples working together, you'll see that here, it's a contra dance. And rights and lefts and circle left and circle right balances. The, the length of the dance is still the same as it was in those dances we saw in the 1700s. 64 counts of music. Sometimes they were 80, but 64 counts. Um, notice what's different. You'll notice the tempo and the drive of the music, like the two we just played. The activity level will be obvious. Uh, the dance interaction will be obvious. And the twirling will be obvious. Again, uh, not to be worried about losing a stitch uh, while you're dancing. Or your face. <laughs> Yeah, this, this dance group is what are called Young Contra Dancers uh, in Ann Arbor. So they're mostly college kids. <laughs> mostly college kids dancing this. If we can kick it off here. Still working two by two. You can see the swings, but not reserved. The tunes, we spoke of Hole in the Wall, Kingdom Coming. The name of this tune is To the City Truck Stop. some resting by some, and then 1900s, everybody's active, <laughs> zooming around and having a good time. And, and uh, notice no one's hurting each other, and a lot of smiles on people's faces here, and they're dancing with the music. So we hope we've given you a little look at, uh, I mean, this, this could be a three-day talk, but <laughs> this, we wanted to give you a little snippet of all three of those centuries, and we're so honored and privileged to be a part of this site and what they're doing. And uh, Ann mentioned earlier, eighth graders come in May. And uh, last few years we've had, let's see, how many hundreds? A thousand. It's a thousand. A thousand eighth graders, 250 a day. Uh, the village here does such a great job. And we do dancing underneath a big tent. And it's very typical of people who are introduced to this kind of dancing. The first one was like, I'm not sure, and I hope nobody sees me messing up. 
the second one, then, so what? And they just have fun, but it's, it's really an interesting uh, evolution of how people feel. Uh, any questions that you might have? A question. I was wondering about your music fiddle. My fiddle is not all that old. It's about a 1900s fiddle of 1890-1900. And it's, this one in particular is from Czechoslovakia. It was a gypsy fiddle. But I've, I've had five or six fiddles over the years, and some are made in Michigan, some are made all over the place. That one's there, pretty nice. Thank you for asking. Question? Uh, at that Regency Ballroom in Indiana, yes. did you say they have reenactments there yearly? We're back there in next month, March 26th. And what city is this? In South Bend, right next to oh, the okay. campus of Notre Dame. Yes. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you go online and check www. RegencyExhibitionBall.com. Uh, you can join the dance. It's not very expensive. Slight yes, of course. I had a question about the people who participate in these reenactments. I I didn't know that people did that. You know, if there are people that participate like the Civil War reenactments. So I'm assuming it's people that share that the interest in learning these period dances. My question um, is about the, the costumes, though. I met a woman a few years ago who sews costumes, historically accurate costumes for Civil War reenactments, and I was wondering if, if that's the case in, in these reenactments, if the costumes that the people wear are, are sewn special for those? Uh, when people take the time to get a real nice costume, Jim and Kim Lynch, Kim Lynch might be the person you're thinking of, also uh, Chris Irwin out of Port Huron, so is those kind of... She made my outfit. Yeah, Chris made, made that. So people do, uh, and some groups are a little looser than others. Some groups are a little looser than others. But some groups are very sticky about, you know, the fact, this hand sewn, and they use these materials, and these cuts. And uh, so you do see that. And uh, dancing as well. Some groups are pretty loose about the dancing they do. Others say, we want to see the source, you know, very historically correct. Another question? I noticed that when you showed us a couple of steps that your feet never really came off the floor, you kind of shuffled. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, the way the dance is supposed to be performed? In the 1700s in particular, uh, the dancing was very low to the ground. 1800s became a little higher, particularly in meadows. Yeah, But the 1900s, <laughs> yeah. Again, clothing was a part of that. And wool, if you were wearing wool trousers, you know, when you were kicking your heels up quite so much. Yes. Yes, please. You said Jim and Kim Lynch, some yes. costumes? L I N C H. And they are from where? They're from Three Rivers, if I remember right. Michigan. Three Rivers, and then the second couple? Was uh, Chris Irwin out of Port Huron. Three Rivers and Chris Irwin. A man? One of them. A woman. Shop, yes, it? but is it, is that the, there's a link at that site. You yeah, know. if you go to the Regency the Exhibition Ball, it shows you a link to Kim's site, Kim Lynch's site. <laughs> yes, of course. Hey, you began your presentation and you said that dancing was mostly in the realm of the well to do people. Yeah. Obviously, that has changed <laughs> to this. Um, they may be very well off and stuff, but they're, they're not flaunting it or whatever, so kind of. Don't, yeah, don't attempt. I mean, there still had to be like peasant dances going on. Yes. The rich people weren't the only ones dancing. Yes. Did, did the poor people do the same kind of dance, but just not as formal, or did they do their own thing, or what? What was going on? Good question. The the dances uh, would be stolen from the balls by the people that were servicing the balls, and they go out in the village and they do them as as best they could remember them. Uh, again, 1700s, there wasn't a lot of written documentation. For pretty much people that weren't of high society weren't able to write, and so there wasn't much in notation being presented to the, to the regular people. But pe there plenty of evidence of people dancing these. Uh, in particular, the Virginia Reel. People think of the Virginia Reel, you remember it in the fifth grade, you know, and the teacher said, okay, all you boys line up over here, and, all your girls. and then straight across from you is your partner. Well, the Virginia reel was a, a, a style of reel unique to the Virginia colony. And there were many Virginia reels. One that people often do is Sir Roger de Coverley. 
but there's troops more hunt the fox, many others called Virginia reels. It was a generic term. So people were dancing those, obviously, if they could find a fiddler, sure, out, out in uh, people's yards and, you know, on properties outside the ballroom. House parties. And then the 1800s, house parties uh, in particular, people were dancing in their homes, uh, very prevalent. If you read uh, one of our favorite series of books is uh, the, the Little House on the Prairie books. If you read those, there's a lot of dancing in there, 1800s. Uh, Pa Ingalls plays fiddle. And so those were, done, those were done in town halls and places like that, but it didn't preclude people dancing in homes, house party dancing. Good question. Thank you. Now we have a question, but I wanted to tell you that I found out something about my mother. My mother was born in 1991, and she lived to be 101. And she, one day at Christmas time, when I was, uh, I was maybe a teenager, had to talk to him about, quote, her Christmases. And she said, she was the oldest of 11. She was born in Warren Village. It was a village then. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, uh, we didn't have much of a Christmas. There, she said, there were so many kids. And she said, uh, I just, well, Dad would go cut a little Christmas tree. She said, Mom and I would put a chicken feathers on it and, and make them out, out of, uh, uh, she said, um, the catalogs they cut up, the Sears catalog, they made rings on She said, that was it. And uh, so, and I said to her, and I said, well, what about, did you have any music? And she said, are you kidding? She said, nobody, she said, happened to play in her family. And she said, Christmas, she said, and I'll tell you right now, Christmas was not my favorite day. And I thought, what was your favorite day? And she said, the 4th of July. And she said, because that day, she said, mom and dad would gather at a dairy farm. And so they could, they had to be back to, some of the kids had to come back to milk the cows. And, but they milk early in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. She said, mom would make a big pot of potato salad and we would pile on the wagon and go to this one park. And she said, that is when I heard music, because they had a small band. And she said, I wouldn't even sit at the table or on the ground where we were supposed to eat. I would take my sandwich and my potato salad and go and stand by the little platform, platform she said, where the band was. And she said, I actually would cry. She said, because already at 10 o'clock, they would play Good Night Lady. She said, everybody had to go home. Farmers had to go home, she said, because there was so much work to do. And she said, that was all I ever heard was music once a year. She said, then when I got to be 16, and just like you said, the different farmers would have dances in their homes. And she said, and then you'd have one or two men that would play the fifth. And she said, so then I would go to those so that I could dance and hear music. And you know, I told my kids that, and even myself today, we had the radio, we have, you know, we have so much TV, we just bombarded, you know, my music since I can remember when I was in the 30s, you know. And to say that you only heard music once a day in a year. People don't realize today how rare that was to hear music. And the, the Little House on the Prairie books reflect that as well. Pocket play. And I think it was Uncle Charles that played the trumpet or something. You know, so there wasn't much music. We'll take a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Does a uh, uh, Rough Water String Band still put on the concert? Does Rough Water String Band pull up put on concerts? We don't do concerts anymore, but we're playing regularly for dances. And uh, in fact, that Regency Ball was rough for Rough Water folks and uh, Civil War Balls, we do so many. Yeah, schedule. Uh, we have a website, www.roughwater.com. Yeah, thanks for asking. We've been together for 33 years playing music. Just friends, too. Just friends, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and big hand for Ann Abram for hosting this event. And, uh, thank you. And I thought I saw Lorraine earlier, too. It's such a great staff here. And Rosemary's here. Such a great staff here. So please do help them. All along the way. Thank you.